I said this before we started, but I have to say it again because it's just true. You have been with me every step of the way on my journey. It's true. That's amazing. I really mean it. You, I don't say this to many people because there were just a very select few when I was in a really dark place, but knew I wanted something better Mm. and could like feel this version of myself within that like she was in there. I just hadn't worked on her enough to surface. Following you and your journey and just seeing how gracefully you handled everything that felt like would tear a person down in their life, truly, and I I mean this, Mm -hmm. it gave me the courage and and the confidence to at least try. Thank you. That's beautiful. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Proud of us because it's hard. (laughs) It's hard. You know, and I I feel like the secret to it is really just deciding I have nothing to lose if I commit to just being fully me. Mm -hmm. And who is she and what does she want? And how can I unleash the fullest expression of her? And and then when we follow that, I think it leads us to all of the best places. But we're going to come up against so much resistance along the way. And it's our willingness to ride that dragon, as we were talking about, that I think leads us closer and closer to where we ultimately want to be, which is back home to ourselves. Right. It is. And I think being in this space, too, there is such a misconception that, like, we have it all together and, like, I'm walking around in this meditative state. I'm like, do you know the work that I do to get to, like, (laughs) at least not punching people in the face on the daily? Like, it's really not all it appears to be, people. Like, this is not, it's not a walk in the park. It's, it takes so much consistency and determination and just like will to get up and to do it every day. I love that you said that. And you know, my belief is that we don't have a problem with willpower. We have a problem with our expectations. Mm. So many of us, you know, we want the rainbow, but hold the rain, you know, as if it should be easier and it should just flow. And ultimately, we want life to flow, but to not expect the storms, the setbacks, the comebacks, the resistance, I think is to sell ourselves short, but also to kind of set ourselves up for failure. Because then when those ruptures happen or those moments, you know, we're confronted with moments where we feel like the rug's been pulled out from under us, we're completely helpless as opposed to having more inner resolve, resilience, and an ability to say, I got this. It's going to be messy, but I'm not afraid of the mess. Not being afraid of the mess is, I think, everything because, you know, even like having you walk in and you're like, your office is so pretty. And it's like, it's just so amazing how things can always appear one way and like Mm -hmm. the weight that you carry on the flip side is and can be just like entirely different as it all looks. And I think that's truly been something I've been experiencing where I am like doing this, you know, being in this work for a decade. I mean, I've been following every, I like lived on your YouTube for well over a decade. I watched every, like every video when you would lay out all your food. I was just like so mesmerized and it wasn't even obsessive maybe (laughs) it was just like you were so comfortable being yourself well you know I let me do a little backstory here please and that's right where I'm getting okay so I was an actor and a dancer and a photographer and you know I got my first agent in New York when I was 19 years old and I spent two decades being everybody but me Mm -hmm. and learning how to be everybody but me and trying to be everybody but me so I could get the job, get the praise, get the approval, make something out of myself, you know. And then on Valentine's Day in 2003, I got diagnosed with an incurable stage four cancer. And that was the like needle off the record moment. It changed everything. And I have a very rare disease. I've been living with stage four cancer for 21 years now. But in the beginning, we had no idea 
what to do, where to go, what the prognosis was. And the first doctor that I went to suggested a triple organ transplant. And then the next one gave me 10 years to live and on and on and on. And it was really in that moment. I mean, I, I remember standing at the elevator and pressing the down button at Sloan <laughs> and feeling like my life was just falling apart. And there was something that rose up in me that just said, no, you got to learn how to be the CEO of your life. You got to learn how to step up and show up for yourself in a way that you never have. You don't fucking know who you are. And that's okay. But that stops today. And so that was like the inciting incident that brought me on this journey of saying, well, I know how to be other people, but what would it be like to learn how to be me, but also take care of me in a way that I was very clueless about, like many of us when we come into the world of wellness. You know, I went down this rabbit hole and that rabbit hole and then I was raw and then I was, you know, it was all the different I things. I remember. I'll do this and that. You know, I, I, I was always, I had a colonic every day. You know, <laughs> I always had enemas. <laughs> it, was like, it was just like the enema decade, you know. And then my point is, is that I tried so many different things. And for a long time, I was trying things to literally feel better, you know, not just for cancer, but because truth was, is I wasn't feeling so great outside of my illness. But when I got really clear about it and sat in meditation about it, and I started to develop more of these practices that you teach so beautifully, um, I realized that at some point my wellness practice was, it was my sneaky way of trying to cure myself. And so I thought, if they can't fix me, then I will, because I must be broken. You know, even though I, I feel like in ways I was blossoming, but I still felt completely broken. And around the 10-year mark of living with cancer, I just realized this was a waste. Trying to cure myself was a waste. I was doing well. I was feeling well. I was already teaching. I was already, you know, my first book had come out, my second, my third. I was already a New York Times bestseller. People were feeling better. And I felt like the biggest phony because I wasn't cured, because I hadn't fixed myself fully. So why would you follow me? And I had to have a real, you know, come to cucumber moment <laughs> <laughs> with myself. Because literally I thought, what if you lived to be 90 years old and you, eight, or 100 years old, whatever it is, you have this long life and you wasted every minute trying to fix yourself. Mm. And I stopped trying to cure myself and I started living. So it was like these moments of evolution that I think each and every one of us have, you know, from yeah. the rock bottom moment to the next moment where it might feel like rock bottom, but maybe it's not as far as you were before. And we get to keep orbiting around these themes, thankfully. Yes. Uh, I totally relate to so many things that you just said coming from working as an actor, model, and being a mold for everyone that I literally ha did not know mm. myself. You know, it was like you, I identified being everything, but the person that I was that I didn't know. And it's, it was, it's, it's forever such a self discovery process of, um, you know, doing all the things. And I was, vegan I've done raw vegan I've done all the things too and while I I agree like there were so many elements that I I think it wakes you up to like feeling better and like wow like you can enhance your energy and improve your sleep quality by implementing these changes there can come a point where it becomes like so obsessive mm -hmm. that it's like almost swallows you where you lose yourself in that yeah, 100%. And I have, you know, I'm, I have to be thoughtful about addictions. So food addictions, alcohol addictions, drug addictions, like that is a path that's easy for me to go down. And wellness became an addiction too, partly because, and I had the greatest reason for it because I had cancer. I have cancer. Um, so it's just about, to me, for, for me rather, it's about right sizing the reason why you're doing it. You know, what's the why behind your practice? Because 
as somebody who's been doing this as long as you have, as long as I have, you know, I'm headed into my second decade of doing this for myself, but also as a living, um, if I'm not really clear about why I'm doing it, I will lose the passion for it, the passion for first and foremost caring for myself and the passion for helping others. Um, so it's something I'm always observing and checking in with. How do you do? How are your, like, what are your check-ins with self? Is this tiring me or is it inspiring me? Oh. Sometimes we can be really good at things that actually really tire us and zap our energy. I am trained to be good at a lot of things or to pretend that I am. Me too. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, but those are the pieces of my life and my business and my work and my passion that will start to fall apart little by little um, if I'm not thoughtful about them. Because I think that when the moment, when we start to find ourselves in a place where we're less led by passion and we're more led by whatever it is, the P&L, like whatever it needs to be in that season of your life, um, it brings you further and further away from your creative force, right? And so for me, the creative force is the number one healing force. It keeps me curious. What does your practice look like right now? It's, you know, it's a journaling practice. It's so simple. It's meditation, but not long. You know, it's... First it's, thing in the morning. Yeah, first thing in the morning. It's actually the first thing I do before I leave my bed is I just say, thank you, body, for another day. Oh my gosh, we did it. We're here. We're here another day. The gratitude. Yeah, I just thank you, body, for another day. And at the end of the day, I mean, I may say like that fucking sucked that day. You know what I mean? But I'm still going to wake up and say, thank you, body, for another day. Um, and then it's, it's a short meditation. And then I journal and I always start the day with the same question, which is, how do you feel? And I, and I answer that question. How do you feel? How are you? Where are you? What's shaking? What's shaking, baby? <laughs> and it's amazing what happens when we continue to develop that relationship with self. I feel like that's the gateway to our intuition, right? And then that's, that's where you can have those tough conversations with yourself. Do I still want to do what I'm doing right now? Or have I shifted? Mm -hmm. Because if I've shifted, then I'm holding back my evolution. I might not be able to make the leap right now. I might have to strategize how I'm going to make the change. But if I've shifted and I am not keeping up with that consciousness, and that desire, then I am literally blocking my expansion. I'm just not ready for it. And that's okay. As long as we acknowledge it. Right? Because I don't know about you, but my life is feisty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm feisty too. <laughs> okay. I mean, if I'm getting a message from self, she's gentle for a second. <laughs> Me too. Okay. <laughs> just gonna run me over. I can be <laughs> real fiery. It's you know, it's just it's such a daily practice for a reason because it just it always amazes me too when you know people will say like meditation doesn't work for me. And by the way, I I think there are so many different forms. It doesn't have to be one way for one person, and you know. It's just, we're all so different and unique, but having people say that, like, it doesn't, how many, and I'm like, you know, how many times have you tried it? Just a couple. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> can you imagine if we just stop? I always, I think about this daily. I'm like, imagine if I just didn't do the work. I would just tear <laughs> shit down. <laughs> like, and then, I mean, I, every now and then I, it's like that version of me seeps through social media. And I'm like, just so you all know, like get a taste of that's like, the Ooh. other versions that you, you know. This is delicious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're just like me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because I think we put labels on things. Ooh. And so if we call it meditation, that can turn somebody off. It's like mindfulness or just taking a moment to zip it. <laughs> like, let me tell you what, when I zip it, good shit happens. <laughs> That's really what it's about because I'm zipping it to let something else come through. That could be peace. It could be insight. 
It could just be a moment to calm my nervous system, to soothe my anxiety, right? So, I mean, you, this is what you teach. I just find that the more we move away from these labels and we just tr- sort of try to reframe things for ourselves and for others, the less likely we are to put up all of our barriers. You're like, that doesn't work for me, really? Have you tried it? Have you tried it more than once? Mm-hmm. Have you tried it for a year? Or a different way. <laughs> yeah. Right. Which is walking. Like, walk, right. walk to your bird feeder. Oh. That's what I did yesterday. I walked to my bird feeder, talked to all my kids. We caught up, and it was a meditative practice, you know? I cleaned the poop off of them. <laughs> the turkeys came, took it all, right? And so, but that alone can be a meditation of me just leaving my space and walking in nature and doing something that I truly love that connects me to something much bigger than myself. Mm-hmm. That's also very simple and tactile and real world, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and to be able to do that and say, I, I love that I get to be a part of this little plot of nature where I'm seeing these beautiful creatures and they're looking forward to me coming out and everybody's chirping when I leave my house they with, get all, so excited. with the bucket. You know what I mean? That's a meditation. You can bring your practice into everything that you do. I used to feel like they were so separate. I was like, I have to, let's do my practice this. And then you know, believe over the years of lifting labels myself, always in the process of, first of all, label identifying, because I don't even think half of us are aware of the boxes that we put ourselves in. And yeah. like, I'm a Sagittarius through and through. I can only live in a box until I bust the way <laughs> out. Like, you just can't tell me to do too much. Like, it just doesn't work with my personality. And I literally felt that way. Like I was just like busting through everything I told myself I was, but then what everyone expected of me, Mm. right? Like I let a lot of people down Mm. and that sucks and that hurts when you, I know you feel the same way about your community. It's like you're so connected to this, this connection that you've built with these people who've been with you throughout all of these phases of your life to disappoint and to let people down. Wow. That like, first of all, scared me when I was primarily Mm. plant-based to like share that I wasn't because Mm. I felt like such a phony. And when I was out eating, if I wanted to eat something, I'm like looking over my shoulder to see if anyone's paying attention to me. I mean, come on. Like, I know, you know, we all think the world revolves around us on social media. So everyone's watching everything. But wow, what a wake me up moment of just like leaning into living my life the way I wanted to live it and actually sharing it online and not giving a shit. Good for you. Yeah. That's like, medicine. Bye. Yeah. I'm sorry that I didn't meet your expectation for the day? Well, look, we can't please everybody. And when we're too busy focused on pleasing others, we're not focused enough on pleasing ourselves and raising our own standards. And what I do, I love sharing, but make no mistake, I am here to take care of me first and foremost. And if you're on board and you, you're interested, I got a whole lot of love for you. If you're not interested, I still got a whole lot of love for you. Yes. You know, but I'm not here to um, seek or get get your approval. I'm here to seek and get my own. And that's enough of a challenge, quite honestly. (laughs) So let me disappoint you, Sally. Yeah. (laughs) Seriously. but, But let me disappoint you because I think each and every one of us, especially as women, have to learn how to disappoint. Yes, we do. Because when we're constantly trying to please everybody and live up to those standards, we are literally chipping away and unraveling ourselves. Uh, Entirely. Right. Like busting at the seams. Busting at the seams. Um, It took a long time to get there, but I think a little bit that helped me was first and foremost living with cancer and saying, well, if I can do this, I can do that. Yeah. You know, and... um, Also, I think a piece of my acting career really served me, which is as an actor, as a model, as a performer, you're going to get rejected a lot. And so you learn that. And if you can survive that rejection, 
and actually use it as an advantage and use it as fuel mm-hmm. and use it in a way that, you know, serves you, you're going to have a lot of staying power. But the second we, you know, get, the second we fall apart because other people are upset with us, I think that we're, we, uh, we slow our process and our growth. Yeah. I know. I see it happen a lot online with people with, it's just, I feel like in the world of cancel cu- culture too, it's so easy to just like walk on eggshells with everything that you're sharing. But I just feel like when you live in that space, which I've been there so many times, it just holds back your authenticity and your, like you were saying, your evolution of letting it all unfold. Yeah. I I love how you're thinking about that. I think somebody out there probably needs to hear this. The only time you can be canceled is when you're dead. Let's be real. Yeah. And so if you mess up, say you're sorry, but pick yourself up and keep going. You know? Yes. And then what we say is just give a shit less about what other people think about you and more about what you think about you. Mm-hmm. Again, that, that to me, and I think you, you shared, you agree, that's hard enough. It is. It's hard <laughs> every day, right? Yeah. To, to just keep pressing forward. I um, have to say, I think one conversation or just one topic that I've actually never talked about on Mm -hmm. the podcast before is grief. And I, you know, I I feel like the second I got your book, I'm not a morning person. (laughs) It's just like everything you do and put out there, it's just like, ugh. No, really. Um, And as a multiple New York Times bestselling author, how do you like let life live through you to the point where it's turned into seven books? Mm. And I think you so graciously talk about a topic that a lot of people are uncomfortable, like myself, talking about. I like the tough topics. I like talking, you know, my first two books were for cancer patients. And then a bunch of books were about vegetables. So that's a tough topic. Yeah. Crazy Sexy <laughs> Cancer was the first. That was the right? first. Yeah, that's when I fell in love. Yeah, that was the first. And so now this one's about grief. And and I like to explore the areas that so many of us are afraid to go to because those have been the areas that I found the most freedom and um, those have also been the areas where I've been the most resistant. And so I wrote this book. I started during the pandemic and I had thought, you know, it's been a long time since I've written a book. I better get back out there. I better do the thing. I should read. I should write like a you go girl. You got this type of book. Like I had all these, you know, ideas mm-hmm. and and they were based on shoulds. Mm. And but when I looked at my life at that moment, you know, my dad was dying. And he's my chosen father who adopted me, one of the greatest human beings I'll ever know. Mm. I was approaching my 20-year anniversary of living with cancer. We were in a global pandemic. My business was struggling. And I was unraveling. And the last thing I could do was muster up a You Go Girl book. Mm. I wanted, like, Bengay and a nap, you know? (laughs) (laughs) I was like, this life is kicking me even harder. And, but I had this idea, even though I had done a lot of my own work with my wellness practice, I still had this idea that if I allowed myself to feel these feelings, grief and the messy emotions that come with them, I would drown. I would get sucked under. That would be the end of me. I'd never come back from it. Mm Because as my therapist so beautifully said, when the grief train pulls into the station, it brings all the cars, right? It brings past grief. It brings stuff that you thought you were over, but you're not. It brings rage and shame and guilt and all fear, enormous amounts of fear. And so I thought, if I open this Pandora's box, it's face off. I'm done. But... So what I did, like many of us, is I just kept trying to hustle harder, hold it up, push, work harder, like anything I could do to avoid feeling. And 
but I, I started to really think about the metaphors that you commonly see in the grief world or grief literature, which is like the waves, the waves of the ocean that pass in and out and in and out. And I, I thought, even if I was incredibly powerful, which I know I am, I'm not more powerful than the ocean. I think about that when you, when I've heard you say this and it always like gets me. Yeah, I'm not more powerful than the ocean. And so what's another way to approach this that's filled with self-compassion and care? And that is to allow myself to tend to the parts of myself and the areas of my heart that are the most in need. And if I can give myself that, I mean, that's why we're here, is to love, to be loved, to share that love, to give that love to ourselves, to find the areas of our lives where love is missing, and to shine that love in those areas. And it's the areas where we hurt the most that need our care the most. And so I approached it like I approach everything else with curiosity. So if I can learn about grief, maybe I'll be less frightened by it. And if I can learn about this thing, like meditation, like movement, like whatever it is that anybody out there is struggling with, mm -hmm. I get curious about it and learn about it, then I'll start to learn how to tend to it. And that's where the healing happens, right? But we can't tend to anything if we don't start with that place of curiosity. Like, tell me about you. Tell me about this magic that you have made, right? I'm so curious. And from that, it's like the friendships develop, the relationships develop, the healing develops. Mm -hmm. Oh, I could just listen to you all. I'm just like, keep talking. <laughs> no one wants to hear me right now. <laughs> no, it's so true. But I feel like for people who are listening that maybe haven't done the work and are still running from themselves. Like, how do you start? You know, like, I I remember feeling that way when I was just in the thick of all the, yeah. the things that were bringing me down, and I liked it. I liked the way I was feeling. I liked bringing everything down with me. I was, like, on the path of mass destruction, and I just wanted to keep ripping through because it was truly what, like, got me high yeah. and help me not feel all the shit. And then when it all came tumbling down mm -hmm. and I realized I actually did feel like death, I, I almost preferred dying. Mm -hmm. You see your life as like these, this split road, right? Where it's like, can keep going here or I can do the scariest thing. Yeah. And I can try to change. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like I feel like so many people struggle with that. Oh, like that shift mm -hmm. to get yourself there, too. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And for me, it was I was up against the ropes. Right. And so it was fight or flight. Yep. And that part of me that's feisty and fiery and, you know, like that's the reason why I have to be very thoughtful around alcohol. I'm good at it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm good at it. So, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, that 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 but that part of me is one of the reasons why I'm successful. Mhm. Mm right? It, it's it's part of who I am and she's she's fun, she's fiery and she but she can create a lot of destruction as well, right? So what I'm saying is is that it's not like I'm no longer going to be her. It's not like I'm no longer um, inspired by the elements that make me me and thankful for them. I have to keep things in check, yes, but thankful for those parts of myself that will work hard, be super ambitious, you know, put herself out there, so forth and so on. But what I, I think the rub for me and what I've seen in my community is that when we have this all or nothing approach, you know, again, for me, I dove head in because I was so afraid. Mm -hmm. One of the questions I would, I often used to get at Q&As is, I know, but how do you do it if you're not up against the ropes? Like, you have a great reason because you have cancer and so you can stay motivated. You know, believe me, we all go back to sleep. There's times I'm not motivated. Yeah. Um, 
but it's a good point. And so I think for a lot of us, it's just about taking a slower and steadier approach. Mm-hmm. You know, we, ha- we raise the bar so high on ourselves. And if you're struggling, then I would say lower the bar. Oh, I love this concept. Put it so low that you'll trip and concuss yourself. You know what I mean? Like literally lower the bar because the chances are you're not doing anything because that bar is so high and you're so tough on yourself. Like if I don't do it perfect, why bother? Mm -hmm. You know, and all the things that we can say and trick ourselves into believing as opposed to like, oh my gosh, I had water today. I drank two glasses of water today. Where is my parade? (laughs) Where's my parade? (laughs) <laughs> you know? Yes. Because that's how we start to change. And, and, but also that celebration of self, you know, the, oh, you only had two glasses of water today instead of like dancing mm-hmm. and like, who's the bomb? It happens to be <laughs> me, you know? And even if it, it's silly, but these are the, these are my little tricks of saying, you know, if I'm going to do this for the long haul and this is a marathon and that means it, it's about the staying power, mm-hmm. right? I'm a marathoner. Like, I don't care what comes and goes. I am like a roach. I'm staying. Me too, girl. <laughs> I am not going anywhere. <laughs> God news, okay? So we inch forward. Inch. Yeah, awesome. we say good me. Yes. Celebrating the t- teeny tiny win of the day, whether it's like today I was just not feeling it. I wasn't feeling myself. I wasn't feeling anything. And I was like, but I know with everything in me that even if I just roll out my mat and I get like 10, I'm aiming for just 10, just do 10, Mm. turned into 12. Because I, you know, once you get, you're like, you come alive, the breath, it's like it fuels you. And then it's just, it's achievable. Right. Like that's like always been my biggest thing with everything that I've been sharing. I think truly before shorter, um, you know, windows of working out were trending, which love it, trend all day, because yeah. this is the trend that I'd love to see thrive instead of mm. these things on TikTok, like 75 hard. And I'm like, just the title. 75 hard. Do you want to do it? No. No. No, No, thank you. (laughs) And by the way, can't wait to see where you are at week two, right? With the burnout and just like, I think we set the bar so high. I even think people do that with dating. Well, we'll, that's a whole other podcast. But to just start with something that's so attainable that you achieve it and then you celebrate that win and it brings you back to day two because you feel damn good that's right I saw you on Instagram you always inspire me to move my body and I have to say that one of the things that I realized while writing this book which I actually didn't have a connection or consciousness to as as I was going back and really like facing a lot of past trauma um, during this last few years I didn't realize how much trauma I had attached to my diagnosis Mm. and how much disconnect I had from my body. Because as a dancer, it was like, I had this thought that I put so much into you. Is is this what I get back? Mm. Whether or not I was aware of that thought. And so there was a part of me that even though I was moving, I was not moving like I used to move. And there wasn't the joy that I used to have. And that was something that I didn't realize, that I was kind of punishing myself. And I was disconnected and cut off from that part of me. And watching your videos and moving with you and the way you approach it and everything has been one of those gateways back in to movement in a way that's really joyful, but also is healing Mm. for me as I continue to, you know, care for this being. But I didn't make that connection. And so I want to thank you for that. My God. First and foremost, it's true. Like the Melissa who was watching you and Gabby Bernstein on stage, she was so insecure. I'm going to (laughs) cry. And literally like was like, how do you, 
do that? Like, how do you confidently show up as yourself and lean into the things that you feel are are in there, but you are afraid to bring them to life? Mm. That girl in me is so proud. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It's like you being you and showing me it doesn't have to be a big deal. Yeah. And it doesn't. You even made me turn the the shower on cold the other day, <laughs> which was a lot. <laughs> I gotta say, I saw you get into that cold plunge, and I was like, I don't. Even, I already think we're friends. I'm like, is she has, What is she doing? <laughs> Meanwhile, I know all the benefits, and, and but I'm such a cat, and cold water is like my <laughs> biggest fear of all. Same. <laughs> so same. But then you're laughing cold and tears. you're crying and you're and you're oh. staying in there longer, and and so my point is. I turned the shower cold <laughs> for one second. <laughs> I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> That's literally all it takes is, I mean, I wish you could have seen me when I went in the first time. I mean, it's amazing what a few things, a mindset shift does because I hate that thing. I have always said, I fucking hate that thing. Like I am so sick of seeing people with their damn cold plunge. <laughs> and then I tried it. Okay. And I lasted 15 seconds, but something like I was like, whoa, yeah. I felt this surge of energy. And I was like, okay, maybe there's something here before I judge it, which I can be quick to do. Right. It's, it's easy yeah. to judge something. First of all, and that you're not good at <laughs> and put it down. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I was like, let me just l- gently lean in and try this again. And then it literally was like 15 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds. When I hit a minute, I was like, whoa, it wasn't in, it wasn't about the cold plunge. Yeah. It was about my capacity to master my mind and to train my brain to think greater than I thought in that moment of being like, what the hell? Like your body goes into shock. You're like, you you go into a state of fight or flight, right? And the thing that brought me back was like this deep nasal breathing. But I had such a breakthrough moment staying in for six and a half minutes because it made me realize very much kind of what you just did to me is like, you can literally do anything yes. that you put your mind to, right? <laughs> and like, I remember just being so like, why would I start anything in wellness. Every girl in wellness who's doing it great is in this room. Why would I? You know, and I think it's so easy to get stuck in that, but we have to shift that way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And the only person who can do it is us. So true. And it takes work and we got to do it every single day. We got to work on these brains because I too can fall into the anxious, depressed mindset in two seconds. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so grateful you didn't stop yourself. Right. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Me too. Every day, right? Yeah. So when you were in the thick of grief and having the moments kind of like start to flash before your eyes as your dad was getting sicker and sicker, like, and and you speak about this in the book, there's one moment in particular that when you were at the drugstore. Okay, there's that one. That one that really <laughs> gets you. And if you can talk about that, because I think even if someone hasn't lived to that exact moment, we all have that mm. where it just, you, I don't want to say break because it's not break, but you, I think you let it all yeah. go. Break open. You open. Yeah. So the book is really a field guide led by stories. And that field guide is to the messiest places of grief, shame, of anger, of the parts of ourselves that we deem not good enough to show others and maybe even bad, you know, and we judge them and they're terrifying because they hurt. And so the story, the through line is during this time, the pandemic and all the things that I just talked about, but also my dad being diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer that was terminal and he was my chosen father. So he adopted me and really was a big part of healing that 
paternal wound. Um, and losing him to me was something I couldn't even, I couldn't wrap my mind around. And so, of course, anything that I don't, can't wrap my mind around, I want to conquer. You know, the part of me that will rise up and be like, that's all you got. <laughs> really? I was like, I'm going to fix it. I know everybody. I'm going to call in all the chits. I'm going to build the healing plan. I mean, everything's going to happen. This is my dad. And um, the problem was, is that it wasn't my journey. And it's not what he wanted, right? He had to go on his own journey. And it was a really tough and intense one. Then treatments were very necessary to even slow things down and give him the amount of time that he ended up having. And so I think the first awareness for me was, oh my gosh, people aren't projects. People aren't projects. And the, the way I can show up for this person I love so much is just to be led by love, only love in this room. And, and that was my mantra and my, my intention, basically. Um, but the story that you're referencing it's like a few weeks before he passed or maybe a month before he yeah. passed. And I'm, my mother had asked me to go get insure because that's all he could tolerate. So I'm in CVS and I'm at the insure shelf and I know what flavor he likes. And I'm thinking, how many should I get? Six pack, 12 pack, case? And I'm doing this rough calculation in my mind, like how long will he be here? And again, I'm not aware of this, but in that moment, I just got hit by everything that I was holding back and nothing could stop the wave, the tidal wave that was coming. None of my tricks, none of my shit. And I, I literally put it down. I'm like racing through CVS because I don't want anybody to see me and I don't know what's going to happen. And I get to my car and I just lose it. And I lose it so much that I kind of don't even know where I am afterwards. And it was almost like I was hallucinating. It was like when the fever breaks. But what came after that was this feeling of feeling better. Even though my heart was broken, even though I was so sad and so terrified and deep in anticipatory grief, Right? Grief doesn't happen just when we lose somebody or when our life changes or when the rupture happens. Grief can happen long before the rupture happens. But regardless, I felt a little better. And then I thought to myself, where are the other places in my life where I'm holding back this medicine? Because the only way I'm going to be able to survive this is to allow myself these moments. They don't have to be as intense as this one, but oh, pushing it down is only creating more stress and inflammation and injury in my body. It's coming out in all these different places, right? It's coming out with my neck. It's coming out with injury. It's coming out with constipation. It's coming out with deep depression and anxiety, it's coming out with feeling forlorn and hopeless. It's coming out because it needs to come out. So what kind of energy do I want to get behind? Do I want to prop up those energies or do I want to prop up a different energy? Unfortunately, the energy that we oftentimes are called to go towards can feel harder, can feel even harder. I mean, you said it so beautifully, those two roads it can feel harder to walk down that path but it's actually not. It's all in our minds, right? Yes. I probably made a fool of myself at CVS. I don't care. I gave somebody else permission to give to to cry to. Maybe we would all be crying in CVS. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, how are you? I'm just so grateful you cried. I'm going to cry now. <laughs> you know, we're just like walking it, around it CVS. Gives, <laughs> you permit. It gives everyone permission. <laughs> I'm. I mean, I'm very in touch with my emotions and have learned even here like when I'm doing the podcast like there's been times where I'm like did I cry every episode <laughs> and I'll be like okay don't cry on this I'm like don't say don't cry like yeah. just just Ew. be you know just because what when you let it is when you you do you feel just this sense of surrender mm -hmm. and and like the 10 
thousand pound weight you've been carrying yeah. on your shoulder just starts to lighten a little bit more. There's a line I have in the book that our messy emotions teach us how to be free. Not free of the pain, but free of the fear of the pain and the barrier it creates to fully alive living. Mm. Right? And that's the shift. And you also say that I love, oh, that was so good. I feel like, I feel like you said it exactly as it is too. <laughs> you always so beautifully say that emotions are information. Yes. Yeah, yeah it just like <sighs> makes me feel safe. Yeah, they are. They're information. And, and if we start to, to think about them that way, then we'll be less mad at them. You know, mm -hmm. less mad at them or less ashamed of them or less judgy about them or making ourselves feel less than because we have them. Oh, this is information? Well, anger, what are you here to teach me? You know, anger is a signaling emotion. It's basically like, yo, ow. Yeah. There's something up, yeah. buttercup. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so if that's the case, thank you, anger, for telling me that. Let me investigate it before I burn down the town, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and that's where that curiosity comes in. Yeah. And, these, and honestly, these are all tricks that I have for myself. So if they help everybody else, fantastic. I mean, that's how we all start, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, I get on the mat. Listen, it's amazing to have a band of people who are like, we're all in the, we are all in this together, but to, to show up for yourself. Yeah is so freaking powerful to like choose yourself mm. every day in the things that make you better and stronger and just more equipped to face it all. Yeah, I agree with you. And I'm going to add that when I don't choose myself, I'm an asshole. Same. I'm a royal asshole. I'm a son of a bitch. <laughs> I am a <laughs> bastard. And I hope cameras aren't on. <laughs> that is the God's honest truth. When people are like, she's fake. I'm like, no, honey, there's a few versions. There ain't, that's not fake. That's real. <laughs> because I'm not going to be my best self. And then I'm not going to be a really kind human. I'm not going to be a good wife. I'm not going to be a good partner. I'm not going to be a good friend. Right? Because I'm in deficiency. My tank is on empty or it's running low. Right? And so how much, what can you give? What more Seriously. can you give? You can't. I had a situation happen this week. Our nanny's been off for the week and which is also lovely, right? Because it like gives you, it, it's given me this ability to like, you know, stop work early or pick them up and have this amazing special time. But on the flip, like I'm also working and doing all the things that I just thought I was so strong. I can handle it all. And I don't need to ask anyone else for help. And no, I, I'm good. And then... I called my husband and I was like, I need you to come home. I I I hit that point that like I can feel it coming. So he <laughs> walked in the door, I put on my shoes and I walked out. <laughs> I was like, I love you. I know you know me. I need Amazing. we all yeah. need this. <laughs> I need to go for a walk. Text me when the kids are in bed and I'll come back. <laughs> and he was like, Okay. <laughs> like it was just I was so proud of myself Good that you. I didn't flip it. <laughs> Because it could have flipped, you know, oh. like so quickly too. Yeah. I'm always amazed how quick it can just. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <sighs> so when you um, and you know, I I ask this because I think, as you've said, like we're all going to die mm -hmm. at some point, and it's scary, and I don't think. We want to think about that or talk about that, but it also does something to you when you let that land, right? Where it's like, we're here, what are we doing? Yeah, 100%. How are we going to use this time? Mm -hmm. But losing someone that you love, like your father, like walking around, like, does everything just feel so different every day? Like the does the hole in your heart get smaller as the days go on? Does it close? Like, 
for, you know, I, I have a friend that just suddenly lost her mother and I'm mm-hmm. like thinking so much about her right now. And just for anyone who's dealing with yeah. loss. The intensity changes, right? But there's still a hole there and that's okay. And because the thing about that I've learned about grief is that it's the opposite of love. And the more we love, the more we're going to grieve, right? And, but to deny grief is to deny love. And we don't want to deny love, but we could. I never want to have an adopted pet. If I get a pet, it's going to die. Yes, it will. And you're going to miss out and all of, you're going to miss out on all those great experiences if you say no to this opportunity of love. Right? So our hearts need to expand more to have the capacity to have the love and the loss. And we all have that ability. I look for moments with my dad every day, you know, so he's still very active and a part of my life. For whatever reason, I, um, you know, I was on the train coming to the city to be with you and my phone was in my pocket. And then when I pulled it out of my pocket, it was on his cell. No. Yeah. And so it, for me, that's a wink. That's a wink. And I have a picture of him on my keychain because I'm a terrible driver and he's a good driver. He, you know, very good driver. So I feel like he's my security system on the road. <laughs> it's true. And so he's in my life. Mm. In the beginning, it was very painful to keep that going. Our first Thanksgiving, our first Christmas, you know, but I'd take a little glass of wine and put it in a shot glass and put it, you know, with his picture at his seat. And he's still there. And that was that was brutal year one. Year we're headed into year three. And I feel like I just have normal conversations with him. You know, like I put him in charge of HR and hiring. You see, he was an entrepreneur and he, he was the person I'd always go to, like, Dad, what do you think I should do about this, that, and the other thing? And even though he didn't know my business, he always had the best advice. And when I was having tough times in business, I mean, you know, it's like <laughs> as things grow and you're not ready for the growth and you're at, the, you're at awkward stages, it's scary. And yeah. a lot of people are relying on you. And there's a lot of paychecks and mouths to feed. And it gets really terrifying. But he would always be the person that I would go to and he'd always tell me to do the hard thing first. And for whatever reason, he knew, he just amazing advice. So I still come to him and say, what do you think about this? And what should I do about that? And Thinking about you, can you believe it's been three years now? I miss you. What's shaking? What's happening out in the stars? Right. So I keep the relationship very alive with good memories, with 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 painful memories, um, but with gratitude that I had this opportunity to have a dad. That's amazing. So beautiful mm-hmm. and so touching and so raw. And it's it, my my dad and I have, I feel like we just have this like a new relationship. You know, I have a lot of a lot of siblings. I have there's <laughs> six of us. Wow. And, you know, my parents did the best that they could. They divorced. My dad moved away. And, you know, it, it changes things. It changes your relationship. And I think you can lose touch. You can lose sight. And um, a few of my friends have suddenly lost mm-hmm. their parents. And one of my girlfriends said to me, you know, you, you think about all the things that you wanted them to do that they should have done, how they should have shown up for you. And then you have kids or, and then you get a dog or, right. Or then you build a business and you just realize like, we're really all doing the best that we can with like the the deck that we're handed at that point. And it really changed my relationship with my parents. And I like last summer, my dad came he was supposed to come for seven days and he stayed for 40 days. <laughs> and it just like, I feel like it did something where I, it's like we repaired mm. and truly without words. Like it was just through being present with each other and like spending time and listening to the stories and just like not thinking about 
the things that I wished yeah. when I was younger. And it's, it's, it's really like, I think like your book and just hearing these moments of people experiencing such great loss, it really does, I hope, like you said, it, it shifts you into your gear of gratitude and to look at like all you do have in front of you and to really like nourish the relationships mm. in your life. Or, you know, I think I've heard you say too, it's like you can strengthen a relationship with like a, a girlfriend that you've lost touch with. Like it's it's really up to us to choose where we put our time and what we prioritize. And it's been a real awakening for me yeah. of just um, like enjoying life with them. Yeah, I love that you said all that. And I love that you've had that experience because it's a real gift to have that experience while people are in physical form. Um, the thing about leaning into topics like grief is I think most of us want to shy away from them. But what I can say as somebody who's been on this path for quite some time and, you know, spent the last four or five years deeply in it is that this is how you find your freedom. It's through these places. And there's no place that we want to run from more than our mortality and the, the consciousness of it. And it's one thing to say it'll teach you how to live more fully, but it's another thing to really practice that. And one of the things that I uh, love sharing from my experience with my dad is how, as his life was getting shorter and shorter, he shared with me about making your golden years now because we all, these are his words, we all put it off, right? Till the kids are out of the house and the business is doing better and this, that, and the other thing is all set up. Our ducks are in a row. And he said, and that's what I was doing. And so I didn't give myself these opportunities, right? I didn't go away in the summertime. I didn't do things because my business needed me or you kids were growing up. And, and he goes, and now, I'm, I've just retired. I just sold my business. I was just going to go play golf with Jay. And I'm dying. So you have to make your golden moments now. And even though his time was shortened, those golden moments ratcheted up, right? And they taught me that it's those little moments, similar to the, what we were sharing about, you know, lowering the bar and making those golden moments now so you have a golden year, golden month, golden day. And not the perfect day where it's all golden, but did you have little kisses of gold in that day? Then that's, that's beautiful. And that's what we're here to do. But not put it off until we think we've got it all figured out. Or until like the rupture comes to an end, which I know like I'm guilty of, you know, I think like that just is like wakes you up. Yeah. I think that's a way through the rupture too, is to say, so when you're in the deepest, darkest moment, lean into your joy, fight for it. Like be a prize fighter for joy, mm. whatever that looks like for you. To me, it could be just going to the bird feeder and being like, children, <laughs> mother's here. <laughs> you, know? uh, you make the world a better place. You do. You are such a change maker. You're just a trailblazer. I truly, truly, like, I just sitting here with you has been such an honor for me and something I am immensely grateful for just you know being that girl who didn't believe in herself for years to just like have you in my presence and to be able to connect with you in this way is is truly like it's like a bucket list <laughs> for me like oh well I appreciate you and I'm glad that I get to be here and that you invited me and that you get to be a part of our friendship. I know. Oh, I'm well, because full, I've no, already considered you no, a friend. <laughs> I know we've been friends for ten years. <laughs> so, hi, friend, Gabby. Can we all do dinner? Yes, I'm we coming. Can do that. <laughs> okay, before we before we end, I do love to end with some rapid fire questions oh, that I feel like for you, this is we be we fun. have to do it. All right. Okay. Let's see what happens. Let's see where my card is. Here we go beautiful book. What's your biggest motivator? 
Ooh, my biggest motivator is my creativity. It is my deepest relationship, and uh, it is the thing that wakes me up. It is the thing that continues to keep me going, mm. and it's something I know I can have until the moment I die. No one said that, and it's like, as soon as you said it, I'm like, yes. yes. Like, I guess you don't realize how that, right, yeah. can be the thing that can just spark it all for you. What's your end-all, be-all self-care ritual? <gasps> oh, my God. My end-all, be-all self-care ritual. I'm, like, dying to know. So I feel like it's changed. It has. You know, there's all of the simple things that we do. And there's all the things that I could tell you that you do, you know. I do it all. You do it all. <laughs> But what came to mind is what yeah. I will say. Yes. There's nothing that I love more than like ending my day, doing the things that I love to do. Like yesterday, I did a 10 minute video and, you know, I did, um, I was very impressed with myself because I'm, I'm working on like lifting weights and mm -hmm. small weights. I mean, like, that's <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I'm a small weight girl too. Small weights. But I'm working on strengthening and I just turned... 52. So it's like, you know, I'm just focusing on that more. And, um, and I felt really proud of myself for doing it because it was dark out. I didn't want to. And, you know, I do it in my garage. And then I came back and I did the thing that I love the most, which is like, I lie in my bed and I light a candle and I eat nectarines. <laughs> I just eat nectarines. I just, I'm just like, and I'm all by myself eating nectarines <laughs> in my bed. <laughs> I'm like, life eat. is good. <laughs> eating in my bed is my favorite thing to do. It's my favorite thing to do. I just want to sit so in, my bed, in my bed and bed just eat. eat anything I want in the bed. And then and my, when I'm in there doing that, Brian's like, okay, this is your night. <laughs> this means I have to fend for myself. I, you're not doing the cooking. <laughs> You're going to chibble. This is what he calls you, chick nibbles. You're going you're gonna to chibble with your nectarine. Have you time. That's a good partner. <laughs> we love that. <laughs> what does it mean to you to move with heart? To move with heart is to move with authenticity, to move with your personality, to move with your full self, and to say, this is me, world. This is what I got. Mm. The end. Like, that's it, period. Chef's kiss. Yes. And you, I, you know, I think the thing that I always gravitated towards with you is like, you were so into wellnesses, but you were so funny. <laughs> just like you, who you are. It's like everything I've seen, like just having you here. It's like, it's so nice to see someone continue to, to you know, I, I feel. Yeah. Thank you. Maintain that authenticity of self. Life is hard and it's scary and it's big, just like cancer is, you know, and I feel like the more I can bring humor and heart and silliness to it, the easier it is for me and maybe some other people who will like lean into some of the harder places. They're like, oh, water's cold if I'm with Melissa. <laughs> You do all of that for all of us. Can you tell everyone where to find you? Your latest book is I'm Not a Morning Person. Give us all the things. Okay, need. so I'm at chriscar.com and I'm Crazy Sexy Chris on Instagram. And, and it's C-A-R-R. -R. Yes. Yes. And, um, and the book is everywhere books are sold for as long as they will have me. <laughs> We're keeping you. Thank you. New York Times bestseller. How does that feel? Mm -hmm. Good. It feels good. Good. It's well-deserved. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>